Hey, what's going on? It's Stranger, and welcome to another YouTube music production video, where my mission is to help you succeed in making music. And today we have a special guest. He's an old friend of mine who goes by John Rolodex. And he recently just put out a new EP on Metalheads called The Rainmaker. It's a beautifully crafted album of deep and breaky cuts. I think you'll like it, so check it down in the link below. And also comment down below and let me know who else you'd like to see on my channel. John Rolodex has been making music for well over 20 years now. He's had music out on respected labels such as V Recordings, Dread, Tech Itch, and Freak. He also runs his own label, Machinist Music. He's got some great stuff there. You can check it down in the link below. So I'm gonna catch up with John and then he's gonna share with us his personal writing style, including how he chops up breaks. You'll learn intimate details on how he produced his tracks, La Bodega, as well as the title track, Rainmaker. If you wanna see more content like this, then make sure you hit the like, subscribe, and share buttons. So this is gonna be my longest video to date, so make sure you take down notes and watch it in parts if you need, because they're gonna be in for a treat. All right, without further ado, let's check in with John Rolodex. All right, what's going on, John? Just doing my thing, man. How are you doing, my friend? Yeah, I'm doing all right, man. It's a nice little Sunday. I guess uh, before we start, I should introduce our audience. So we got John Rolodex here. He's a OG drum and bass producer, one of the OGs of Canada, been producing for well over 20 years now, and he's got releases on many big labels out in the UK. And uh, we actually shared a release together over 15 years ago on Metalheads on their MDZ04 album. Mm -hmm. And uh, John returns to Metalheads just recently with his four track EP, and it's a monster CP. So, well, six tracks, but who's counting? Oh, six. <laughs> All right. Six monstrous tracks, man. Thanks, brother. Nice to be uh, be doing this with you. What you been up to, bro? Well, working on a lot of music, you know. Um, it's been an interesting year with COVID and everything, so I've had a little studio time that I wasn't really planning on, but I've enjoyed it and made the most of it, that's for sure. That's sweet, man. I was wondering, when did you make the tunes for the Rainmaker EP? Most of these tunes were made in 2018. Um, they were most of them signed in uh, January of 2019. And then last summer I made Unadorned and uh, Interstel or Interdimensional Espionage. Those were going to come on a later EP, but when we decided not to do vinyl for the release, we were able to add two more tracks. So that's how we got, got to be a, a six tracker. I like how the album sounds so cohesive, considering how the tracks have been produced through um, a span of time. Your sound has really come along. I really love the use of raw breaks and that distorted 808 which has kind of become kind of a signature to your sound <laughs> yeah i'm a big fan of that you know it's uh, i met dillinger a few years ago and i told him that everything i uh have learned over the years was stolen from him so um that's definitely uh, a page out of his book yeah dillinger's a legend and i personally have gotten so much inspiration i've learned so much from studying his techniques he's a mastermind in the studio absolutely it's also really interesting to see how metalheads has been on fire recently and a lot of the ogs are coming back with like producers such as fanu who did a, a release for them i saw an album or ep by frisky so that was nice to see and they've also, they're also bringing up some of the newer producers so it's really cool to see this movement with metalheads happening it's a really healthy camp but you know hitting the 25 year mark in absolute full stride and there's so much crazy music that's about to come out as well there's the big 25 year stuff which is is going to be announced pretty soon and uh i know there's some killers on there so yeah let's talk a little more about the rainmaker ep so you've made the ep over the last couple years and it's all come together i'm, I'm pretty uh pretty pleased that you say it's cohesive because i feel like it's a pretty broad range of tracks you know you've got some really uh breaky stuff and some really steppy stuff some fairly techy stuff and then some fairly traditional sounding stuff that's just break beats and subs, you know, so I'm, I'm glad you think it's cohesive. To me, it sounds like a pretty wide range. I think it, it shows your range, but it, it still sounds like John Rolodex is, is what I, I'm getting at. Well, that's definitely the goal, you know. It takes a while to find your own sound, and I think after all these years, I'm kind of finally there. 
So I noticed that on this album that there's some really lush atmospherics. There's even vocals. For one, who did the vocals? So the vocals on the Rainmaker are on a, a vocalist called Khadija, who I've known for a long, long time. She's from here in Edmonton. Uh, we've worked together a bunch of times over the years. Um, her and T Power and I did a tune called That Jungle Vibe, which came out on V Recordings in about, um, well, I don't know, about five, six years ago, I guess. And those are the only releases we've had. But I mean, she did radio commercials for me back when I had the first drum and bass website in Edmonton. We go back a long, long ways. So really, really nice to get her. And she's so talented. And every session is just like a home run. I have to, I have a difficult time choosing which take to use because they're all so good. Just an extreme talent. Was that all done in one session in terms of the recording? That was one session, yeah. How was it done? Well, what we did, I knew what type of track I wanted to make. And I wrote the pads and the piano. And I just um, got her in. She came over to my house and... I had written the lyrics as well. Um, and then we just, yeah. Usually what I do is I write the lyrics and then the vocalist will bring their talents to the melody part. Or we'll massage the, the words a little bit. That's really cool that you're also taking a part in the writing process in terms of the lyrics. You don't really see that a lot in terms of producers who actually write the lyrics or have a creative input on that. So that's really interesting to hear you yeah, say Yeah, I that. suppose not. I mean, I think a lot of people just grab an acapella, but I prefer to challenge myself a little bit. And I've, I've written quite a lot of lyrics over the years, but just never gotten around to using some of them. And slowly I'm getting to record things. That was kind of a bespoke thing. I had something in my personal life that that was about and wanted to tie that in. Nice. Where does this, the writing come from? Is that like a, another side of, of your creative, I guess, well, creative yeah. expression? With the big ego and everything, I consider myself a man of all trades. <laughs> uh, you know, I did the artwork for the EP and the video and all that stuff. I try and do anything that's creative. I try and have a hand in it. So, Wow, you really put your um, footprint on this release. It's very personal. I mean, that, that little kid in the picture is me. I thought that was. Yeah, that, that was interesting. Yeah, that's one of my baby pictures, which, uh, you know, I guess it's sort of uh, inspired by the way they did that with um, Biggie Ready to Die or something like that. Nas Illmatic has a picture of him as a little kid. It's sort of a hip hop thing. It's like, a, I don't know, maybe showing a vulnerability to counteract the really aggressive side of the music. That's true. It, I do see artists doing that where they put their baby photos or childhood photos in their albums, kind of like showing them their their progression coming full circle as an yeah. artist. I wonder if it's also like, hey, look, Ma, I made it. I, that wasn't that <laughs> one, In yeah. the hip-hop context, I could see it. Yeah. So why the name Rainmaker? Well, it's just a reference to the silver lining thing, right? Just thinking about rain clouds and that's the lyric. You always see me with that silver lining. And then the video takes expands from that as well with all the cloud footage and that sort of thing. I heard that you want to walk us through a, a bit of your process today. What did you want to show us? Well, I thought I'd demonstrate, you know, the way that I construct a tune. And we'll start out with something that's fairly straightforward. And then we'll go to something that's not so straightforward. So the one I wanted to start with is called La Bodega. That's also from the EP. So yeah, here's the project. Um, and generally the way that I will start is with just a kick and a snare. So yeah, I just start out with something along these lines here. And quite often I'll use like a rim and then I'll add a clap or something like that over top. And I should point out, this isn't the, um, we're not working off the finished version. This was an early version and I'm just demonstrating how the, the process of writing goes. So what I do, is I start with a 16 bar loop or sometimes just an eight bar loop or even a, a two or a four just to get a groove going. But I'll start with a kick and a snare and I'll start adding in some percussions, so some hats. So one interesting thing I've noticed right away is that you program your beats with audio. Has that always been your process? Almost. Um, I have tried it the other way and I find for me, I like to be able to zoom right in. We'll get to this when I show you another tune. But I like to be able to zoom right in and see, especially if I have layers, to be able to look at them and go, okay, we've got this peak here and this peak here. How is it interacting with this one here? Do I need to invert this channel? 
where's the transients landing on these layers of percussion? And I also like to look at when you have little shuffles and stuff, just where they all sit on the groove, and you don't get that when you work with media or with uh, MIDI. You bring up a really good point. I've never thought about that before, about how with the audio, you can be really surgical and see where the transients lined up. It's a very high precision method. It's definitely far more time consuming and uh, it's not for everybody, but it is how I like to do it. I learned something from you already. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I've been learning lots from your videos, so I appreciate it. Nice to be able to pay back a little. So yeah, I just keep adding stuff in until I have a, a bit of a groove and I'll add in some syncopated, in this case, there's some little cowbells, some rims, and this one's marked as W percussion, but it's actually a, uh, like just a little sound that I came across that the vibe kind of built from there, but I'm just gonna let it play for a sec. So you can see that's not a percussion sound, but it was probably in a percussion folder, so I just like the vibe of it. And then I, when my shoulders are kind of bouncing and I'm getting a, a, a groove, I'll start writing bass lines. And typically when I'm working with a loop, I'll try and write four or five. And the reason you do that is you have a better chance of writing something that's going to be good. You pick the best one. It only takes a second to write a bass line typically. So. Now, are each one a different bass sound? or are, No, are... I'll, I'll usually pick a sound and then I'll try some different progressions and some different patterns. Okay. This one's actually pretty close to the finished one. Now I've deleted all the ones that I didn't use. So you're only seeing one pattern here, but this is spread out over a bunch of different sounds. Mm. And it's kind of funny with this one. I started this track um, when I was working at my day job. I had kind of like a day of standby and I was sitting in, it's a funny story. I was sitting in a warehouse called La Bodega, which was um, a site of a tragic incident at the construction site I was at or the industrial site. Mm. And there's actually a clip at the end of the track that has the news report about that story. Wow. Pretty pretty strange thing. So I ended up keeping the name because it just fit with what, what I was doing. So then what I'll do once I have a progression I like is I'll flick through a few variations. Oh yeah, so where I was going with that story is the stab is actually just a bass drum that's been distorted. Okay. I'm just gonna play a clip of that. Yeah, let's hear it. So yeah, I didn't have any stab sounds. Okay, so it's an 808 bass drum with some distortion and through that you're able to make it sound more like a stab. Exactly. Yeah. So then what I do is I'll try some different variations. So And then you sometimes end up getting a flavor for, well, I could drop it with, with this sound and then 32 bars in, I could switch to this one or use this one at the second drop. You get different ideas of where you can go with it. You can cut them up and, you know, I could say use two bars of this one and then switch to this one two bars later. Mm -hmm. But eventually I'll, I'll pick ones that I like. The other thing I'll do is I'll usually build a nasty mid bass sound. And then I'll make a version that's just subs. There we go. And then I'll start writing other sounds over top. So I'll start adding in stuff like that. And usually around this time, I'm gonna pause and figure out what chords or scales I'm working with. Now, I don't have a lot of music theory training, just what I've read in books and learned from friends of mine. I'm just gonna pull up a website real quick that I tend to use. So it's just called looknohands.com. And what you can do is just look at the first note in your bass line plug it in here, flick through some different scales, and it'll help you figure out what chords you can work around and use those as a framework for anything you wanna play. And the reason you wanna you want to do it this way is it helps you to work cohesively. Now, if you have more music theory than me or you grew up playing an instrument, you probably don't need this, but for a guy like me, this is extremely handy. So around the time I've settled on my bass line, I'm gonna come in here, I'm gonna figure out what chords I'm working with, and I'm going to write that down on a piece of paper or a little note in my phone. And then I have a framework to build everything else off of. Okay, so just to reiterate, so this looknohands.com, you can, I guess, input what notes you're, I guess, you're playing with your bass. And it'll tell you what other notes you can play that will work. Yeah, 
So say I have three notes in my bass line. I can come in here and go, okay, well, it's this one, this one, and this one. So I can also use this one, this one, and this one. And that would be C pentatonic blues, for example. That's not what that tune is, but that could be a way to work. And now you know if you want to build some pads or you want to build some arpeggios or anything musical, now you have a framework of what might work. Yeah. And you're not just mashing keys um, blindly trying to decide how to advance the tune musically. That's a really neat tool. It's sort of a reverse engineering from having any training in music. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's tons of tools nowadays that really help yeah. a, a producer that may not have that training. Absolutely. Um, well, I know there's, um, the way there's sample packs, there's like MIDI packs and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. And you can always transpose those up and down. But Exactly. Uh, for me, I just like building stuff from scratch and that mm -hmm. works really well. So what I'll do now, I've got a groove going. I I've, I've understand what chords and what scales I'm working in. And then I'll just start adding sounds in. Adding some pads. I just keep adding stuff. It doesn't all mm -hmm. work together. And sometimes I'll add something and then I'll take it away and then I'll make some new stuff. Yeah. This was funny. I was actually, um, I had two laptops going. I was in a hotel room somewhere working on this tune. And I had a, just a TV show going on another laptop. And then there was a scene that had this pad here. So I heard this pad and I was like, wow, that sounds amazing what synth is that coming off of and i realized it was actually coming out of the other laptop from the show i was watching so i grabbed it because the vibe was absolutely perfect for this tune that's a really so nice pad sense. yeah that's cool there's always a bit of um you know a bit of luck in making music yeah I think. oh yeah I, so i just keep adding stuff Stuff like this here, you can see this ramps up. It's sort of a transitional element. Mm. Stuff like that's really handy too, just for getting you from one section to another. See how it just... And then sometimes I'll, uh, once I have the whole chords scales worked out, I'll write like a long passage like this. But I always try and not extend the loop until I have lots and lots of material. Mm -hmm. Can we have a look at what those notes look like in that long passage? It's just a nice big scale. So you start out fairly narrow. Yeah. And then your your higher notes and your lower notes start to build as it yeah. progresses. And again, you're using a tool to determine what notes you could layer in there. Yeah. Well, I'm playing this. I'm, I'm fiddling around. So I'll probably do a few passages. And now that Ableton will just let you record constantly without even trying, you can just keep playing and playing and go, Oh, well, that sounded really cool. What, what were those notes? I love it. But you just, once you have a framework, so I tend to work in octatonic scales, so it gives you a lot of flexibility and a lot of clusters. I like, that's called a cluster when you have two notes that are adjacent. Um, gives you that sort of dark, suspenseful feel. Yeah, that source direct thing that I was bred on. And then I also try and make some little textury things, stuff like this. This one here was just a sample that I came across. And then once I feel like I have enough stuff that I can arrange a tune, I start to get a feel for you know, which parts go with which. I'll mute stuff. I'll just loop everything and mute stuff on and off. And then when I have a section that I'm in love with, I'll copy that, move it over, um, create another section in the dot, and I'll say, okay, this is one section here. These things go together. And then I'll delete all the other things so I don't have to mute and unmute. And I know that that's one section. 
and then I'll figure out what sounds good for an intro. I'll move that up to the front. Usually I'll bring those back in uh, a little later in the tune for the breakdown or whatever, um, second drop, and, I'll, and then I'll start arranging. But I always try and make sure I have an abundance of sounds, even stuff that I may or may not use, but you want to have nothing but choices and then start arranging. That's, I guess that's what I'm trying to explain here. Yeah, that's a good process. And it's something that I go by too. If you have more elements, and you may not use every element, but the more choices you have, it becomes easier when you move on to the arrangement stage. Mm -hmm. And it's also important, I think, when you're doing it this way and you're making a lot of elements, you got to remember, you don't have to use it all. If there's something that sounds really cool, but it doesn't fit, just set that aside. Do a save as and stick that somewhere else because you can always use it in another tune. You can transpose it up or down, make it fit in. I just found something the other day that I wrote in the Rainmaker and I was like, wow, I forgot about these little stabs. They didn't work in this tune, but they'll sound great somewhere else. So you just set those things aside. And that brings up another point I really want to drive home to anyone. Save as is your friend. I hear so many stories, oh, I opened a session and it didn't work and now I lost the whole project. Well, you, every time you make a major change or every time you sit down for a new session, whichever comes first, go save as, start with a new date, and then you have a new backup of your tune. They don't take up that much space on your hard drive and they'll save you so many hours of heartache. I've heard it time and time again, veteran producers like, oh, the project doesn't open anymore. Like none of the versions? Well, there's only one version because I overwrite it every time. It drives me up the wall. You do that, right, Alan? Oh, I, I have like version 21F. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> November. exactly. I usually date them and then I'll go like yeah. A, B, C, D or I'll be like baseline change yeah. or side chain, whatever the major yeah. change was. Yep, yeah. exactly. Right. Absolutely. So... That's more or less how I write a basic drum and bass roller or something that's not particularly complicated. Now this, a tune like this for me, I am pretty heavy with the layers. I'll end up with like 30 or 40 channels. Um, mm -hmm. It's a lot different when I do a tune like the Rainmaker and I want to show you that next. So I'm just going to close this project and open that. I definitely like this approach where the concept is, is simple to execute but it allows you to be very creative in terms of adding many different layers that you can choose from when you move into the arrangement stage. It definitely, it's something that resonates with how I write as well. Let's give people a, a little taste. <laughs> Man, I just love how you cut up those breaks and snippets of those Meadowheads breaks. How you sneak it in there. It's done so cleverly and it sounds so <laughs> cohesive. Thank you, sir. Um, so we talked a little about this one starting earlier. Basically, I started out with just the strings and the piano. Some of these layers came in after, you know, the atmospherics and stuff in the background. Um, this piano actually wasn't the one it started with. My good friend, Mark T. Power told me he wouldn't let me release it with that in. So he made me come over to his house and use a, a very expensive VST piano that he has to record a new one. So I spent a couple hours doing that, just recording those same MIDI notes over and over because the velocity was very different from what I'd sent him for MIDI. He tried to do it with just the MIDI. Are you allowed to tell work. us what VST that was? Uh, it's Ivory which I have a copy of it now, a different one than he bought because they all they have different piano models. But um, yeah, they're much nicer. I think I just had an Ableton built-in piano, which they actually sound pretty convincing and you hear a ton of them. But he told me he wanted to hear a real piano because I was going to so much trouble with the rest of the track that we might as well push the boat out a little further. You know, you're going original vocals and like all the things, right? And So just to give people an idea, this track, the final mix down... This is my microphone. This ended up being 72 channels. Wow. And I think at one time it was up to 85. Um, my buddy Jamal was giving me a hard time. He's like, you need to learn how to use fewer channels. But I don't think he realized that I was talking about something like this this track that has so many different um, breakbeat elements going on and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So I'm just going to um, do a walkthrough. Well, we already talked about the intro and that. I don't think we're going to spend any more time okay. on that. But um, 
I'm just going to start demonstrating some of the drum work. So once we had the intro and the vocals and Khadija's work was done, it was my track to screw up. So I knew we had something special there and I wanted it to sound something like it came out. I wanted it to be a heavy breakbeat workout that was not too aggressive, not like an Eamon Reese tear out type thing, but maybe some distorted 808s like we did and some, some real breakbeat pressure that would make the other breakbeat producers stroke their chins a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I'll show you how I built the drum kit, but let's turn everything else off first. Okay. So you can see this is the drums channel mm -hmm. and there is 32 channels of just wow. drum samples. I love how there's so many, but it sounds so cohesive as one break. There's a few tricks to that. So the break beats are layered in a couple different ways. I don't like to give away the names of my break beats in classic uh, Cool Herc form. So we started out with um, this break here, and I always channel separate them out. Kick, snare, uh, kick, snare, hats, rolls just because you want to maximize the control and there's different EQs on each one. So for example, the kick has a boost. I wouldn't do it this way, but this is a couple years ago. I'd probably cut it around here, but there's a boost on this one. I've done a boost at 216, mm. which is one of my favorite frequencies for kicks. So uh, boosting 200 for the kick, what, what is the intent there? I like it at 216 because the subs start to kick in around <clears throat> 108. So that's the next harmonic down. I tend to work in the A4 432 tonal EQ settings just because if you tune your EQs, everything is going to sound cohesive. What's A432 for our audience? So A432 is a tuning. So A440 is what most, most pop music is written in. And A432, there's a lot of um, sort of esoteric people who think it's like a spiritual frequency range. I use it because the numbers are real easy for me to remember. Mm. 108, 216, 432, 864, and so on. It's just, it's just a number system that's real easy to hang on to for me. And then I find within those ranges, especially if I'm tuning bass or, or uh, EQing bass, I'll tune the actual note in the 432 tuning. So I have a tuning table that I'll bring up and I'll go, okay, this is an F note I want to emphasize. So I'll tune the F in that register. And then if that doesn't sound right, I'll tune the fifth or the seventh up or down from that note just to get the tonal characteristics I want. But if you're going to EQ something, especially with a peak of some kind, you might as well do it on purpose. Yeah. Not just move the sliders around. I mean, this isn't something that you can really get into as a new producer, but when you're decades in and you're punching in numbers, if you learn a few number systems that go with this art form, you can just add a certain sheen to your music. So you can see this is the snare here. And I've got a, a high shelf, and this is called a Baxendel curve. It just brings up the very high frequencies. I know that my hearing, for example, cuts out around here. I've had hearing tests in the last couple of years, and I don't really hear this range, but I can perceive it a little bit, and younger people can really hear this. But when you see on the meters, uh, let's just let it play, you can see there's a big dip here, and that's from the recording equipment that was around when this breakbeat was recorded. So if you record this on modern equipment, you'd actually get frequencies all the way to the top there. So we're just trying to fill that in a little bit. So is DMG EQ your choice of EQ for this type of process? Yeah, okay. e e Equilibrium is absolutely my favorite EQ. Shouts to DMG. They totally do not sponsor me, and I'm uh, kind of hoping they would one of these days. I've sold a lot of their stuff for them. Hopefully we, they hear this uh, <laughs> interview. Maybe I'll send it out to them. <laughs> yeah, that'd be all right. So yeah, I start out with my kick and snare. Um, usually I'll start out now in this case, I've actually made a second version of this snare and there's a slightly different EQ. So we were just looking at this EQ here. This channel has the same stuff going on in the top end. Actually the shelf I got rid of, and then I've got a bump here and a, uh, a kind of a reduction here. And what this does is it just shifts the tonal characteristics in the mid. So you can actually take one snare. This is the same snare here. They're color coded. So I know this is the same sample. Mm -hmm. but I'm actually changing the tone just a tiny bit. Nice. It doesn't really come through probably over YouTube, but you can hear it's a slight variation and it just adds a little more human kind of vibe to it and a little more funk to it. Really big that. So um, then we add in some hi-hats. Uh, where were the hats? Thank you. 
And then we added in this classic breakbeat, which is heavily high passed. And then we, we start bringing in a few more snares. So there's, where's that other guy? See, it's a lot of channels to, to go through. Uh, this one here. So this snare is from a totally different breakbeat. And what I did was I tried to, I first of all pitched it. Uh, it's already been flattened again, but I pitched it to match as close as, as possible. And then this particular boost here boosted this harmonic kind of spike. Mm. But I wanted it to sound like it was almost another snare that was never used in this break. Yeah. And later in the track, um, we, we introduce another snare sound. So again, trying to tune them so they all sound like they're coming from the same place, trying to EQ them, not so aggressively that you won't be able to identify it. In this case, I applied a little dynamics to it. Mm. And you can see there's a few things going on yeah. EQ wise. to kind of make it sound like it's part of the same team. And then you get into adding in all these other little little layers, so that's later on. Now typically when I'm using little vocal stabs like this, I won't keep them in the drum bus, but in this case, because there's a certain amount of weight to them, I actually had to manage. So like when this vocal hits, you have to factor that in, and I've probably corrected, in this case, I've just changed the decay of this snare just to make room for it. Mm. So it doesn't make a huge spike when you mix it down. Yeah. And get really distorted when it gets limited. And I've also, looks like here, I've got a little, I call it a helper layer. So this one is just added into, um, just to beef up whatever was going on in that roll before right. the snare. Nice. So there's lots of little emphasis mm -hmm. bits put on and everyone's commenting on it. This classic one that's in lots of reinforced and metal. Love that one. Yeah. Um, Goldie's Timeless. Yeah. yeah. So that, you used that back in the day as well, mm -hmm. I think. You and Gremlins. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's a little bit different approach to the other way. So, and people always ask me how you come up with these drum patterns. For me, I hear them in my head and I sort of beatbox them. And I start to, after years of doing this, you can... You can go, okay, well, I know to make that pattern, it's a kick and then a snare and then a kick on the next eighth. And then you sort of feel it out. But what you could do, I guess, if you were learning is you could beatbox it in, record that, and then use your beatbox as a template. So quite a bit different approach to drums from how you teach in your channel and probably a far more time consuming. But you, you get microscopic control on things and you can control DKs. So say I don't like the way this little ghost snare say I think it's too loud or something, I can just go in and go, okay. And I can even look at it, you see it's late here, but because it's a ghost snare, I like mine to be late, but I could always move it around a little and just micromanage every element of it. So yeah, uh, how much more do we want to talk about this track? Where else do we want to go with it's it? It's really up to you. I mean, what you've g given us is, is all valuable information. So I, I'm sure our viewers really appreciate what you've, you've uh, told us today. Well, it's my absolute pleasure. Actually, I'm going to show off one more little trick that I think more people could benefit from. So in the vocals, I had these great vocal recordings from Khadija, but I wanted to do a little more with it. So we actually made what I call vocal pads. So what I'll do is I'll take a little phrase that I think sounds particularly nice and I'll loop it and then I'll put some delay and some reverb on it. In this case, I, I use Isotope Trash a lot. I'm also not endorsed by them. They can feel free to send me something nice, I guess. Um, but I'll use the, I really like the delay in here. You can EQ the output and stuff like that. You can use the convolution. This is a metal barrel it's running through, but you can also, I like the amps. Um, you can distort it. You can have multi-band distortion. It's just such a powerful tool for mangling things. No worries. And then you end up with...
that's the rainmaker. I love how um, you use the the trash plugin on the vocals and using those convolution settings to really bring the vocal snippets into another place so it, it kind of sounds like a pad. So that's a really interesting technique. Thank you. So is that all you wanted the show today? Yeah, I think that gives people a pretty good idea of where I'm coming from and where I'm at at, at this point, or at least at the point of writing this one. This is a couple of years ago now, so... Looking at looking at what I've got going on for plugin chains and stuff, it's kind of like wow, I would do it a lot differently today. Mm-hmm. A lot of the EQ settings I would do in a lot more controlled manner, but just because I've learned things sending off to master since this was done, going oh, I can control this and create a little more space here and there. It's all about having things in control. Yeah, it's interesting what you can learn once a, a track goes into that mastering stage. You realize oh, I could have done this perhaps a little differently. Yeah. Absolutely. It's an ongoing process of learning. Well, a good mastering engineer will give you feedback and ideally let you have another crack at the mix down if there's if they feel they can get more out of it on their end. That's what T-Power does for me. Big shout to Mark. Big shout, Mark. Before we go, I want to talk to you about something. A long time ago, I think before I even met you, I heard a story about you. And I just want to know if it's true or not. I can't remember whether it was mystical influencer sniper told me this story but i heard that you came into eastern block before anyone knew who you were and you had a shopping bag full of dub plates of your own tunes that you'd cut yourself and you brought them in there like wanting people to hear your music and i just thought now is that true that that is pretty true yeah i wouldn't (laughs) say it was a shopping bag of dub plates i think the one time the first time i i stepped in there with a i stepped in with one dub plate it was a uh, one of my first tracks. It actually happened to be released on Flex Records. It was my first release. Uh, I think it was called uh, Freezing Point, or it was the Troublemaker. So I brought that there before before Wicked. Yeah, Shouts big up L Double and Flex Records crew. Shouts out to DJ Steppa. So yeah, I, I brought that dub plate to Eastern Blot Records in downtown Toronto because I, I really wanted to become part of this drum and bass community and. I knew that that was where the heads go to get their tunes and really looked, looked, <laughs> looked up to the Vinyl Syndicate crew, Pat and Chris, Mystical and Sniper, and really wanted to impress them yeah. with my track. So or in my early days, I would always go there. Uh, I'd bring a tape and show Pat one of my new tunes, that kind of thing. So that story is definitely true. Yeah. I just always admired the initiative. You know, you don't see anything like that anymore where... People like go the extra mile to show how committed they are to, to going someplace in this little thing of ours, and I always thought that was Thanks a cool so. story. But the way I heard it, it was like a grocery bag. Grocery <laughs> bag <laughs> That's funny. Like you came <laughs> armed. I think it, it might have been you know? some other records in there as well. M- maybe. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it. We're definitely awesome. d- different times now in, in the way music is done and how music is yeah. shared. So definitely uh, reminisce on those good times absolutely absolutely but uh i think the takeaway is you you have to have conviction with your with your music and uh you know even if you don't feel confident about it you just got to push through and be like i think i got something here and you got to step out of your comfort zone and show people what you have to offer i definitely agree there's definitely lots of people out there that that feel like they're they're not ready but you you won't know unless you have someone else hear your track and get feedback that that's the only way you can grow and become better yeah absolutely cool man so yeah just want to say thank you so much john for showing myself and my viewers your personal process for inviting us into our studio to show us around in in your recent tracks and want to congratulate you on on your latest release this monster six track ep on on metalheads and everyone make sure to check that out Go buy the album, go check it out on Spotify, go follow John Rolodex. I'll put all, all his links and social media links down in the description below so you can check him out. And yeah, this, this is amazing, John. So thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Alan. I really appreciate it. And, and congrats on everything you're doing. I'm, I'm loving it. Thank you, man. You know, I watch every video. <laughs> <laughs> all right, cool. All right. We'll catch you soon. All right, so that was John Rolodex's breakdown of his tracks at La Bodega, as well as Rainmaker on his Metalheads EP. And make sure you follow him on his social media down in the links below and check out the EP. And if you enjoyed this video and you want to see more content like this, then make sure you hit the like, subscribe, and share buttons. All right, that's pretty much it for today, guys. 
Thanks for watching. Keep practicing. I'll see you at the next video.